Thank you folks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to interact with this audience. Uh, yesterday with students from MSU, my first visit here. Um, I'm a neuroscientist and I study the brain. This marvelous computer in our heads. This marvelous organ because of which we can see, feel, hear, have the rich experience of life. Okay. This is the privilege I have of studying this structure. This is a picture of all of the nerve tracts in the human brain. Look at it. These pathways are what give us all our perceptions, our feelings, our functions. <coughs> These pathways can't be wired up the way you wire up a computer. You can't go buy the parts and you know, solo things together. You have to grow them in place. That's the subject of my research. But before I jump into that, I would like to challenge you folks a little bit. Um, but how confident we are about our brain function, how confident we are that we know the world around us. Okay, humans are great at this. We are so sure. We are so sure. Let's challenge this today with a little bit of some experiments. Nothing bad will happen, I promise. Okay. The world is rich because of color. Okay, we see the world in glorious technicolor. And this is supposed to change a slide somewhere. Where do I point? Yeah. Is seeing believing? Is seeing believing? You see these glorious flowers. I saw many flowers on the way in. I don't think people would argue too much if I say, okay, the top one's purple and white, the middle one's yellow, the next one's purple. Yeah? If you don't see these colors, come and see me outside. I'm a neuroscientist. <laughs> Okay, but you know, here's our arrogance. The world is the way we see it. You know that we observe the world only in a limited spectrum, what we call the visual spectrum. There's so many wavelengths out there we don't see. Okay, there is so much information out there that we just don't see. But we're like, oh, we can only sense this spectrum, so that's how the world is. I mean, how limited is that, right? If only we could see an ultraviolet. If only we could see an ultraviolet, here are these same flowers photographed with ultraviolet light. And I'm taking a chance here. It went away. Okay. Am I doing it or are you? You're doing it? So I should just say click, click each time? Okay. Here. Um, ultraviolet. Look how the flowers transform, okay? Now, we can't actually see ultraviolet, so these are color-coded for us because our limited eyes can only see it. <laughs> yeah? But look how the bullseye patterns show up in these flowers. There's difference in the center, difference in the surround. And this one down here has a nice bit of a landing pad. Who do you think the flowers were meant for? You and me, so we can offer them to the people we love? The flowers were meant for insects who can see in ultraviolet. And look at, the, look at the patterns relevant to the insect, so the insect can find the center of the flower. Okay, meant for a completely different purpose. We think we see this. There are many, many more insects in the world than us. And we have the hubris to claim this flower is yellow and purple. Okay, threatens our sense of what we know, right? Okay, now, I'm announcing happily that I see purple and yellow and purple, and I'm so happy with the fact, and most of you are agreeing with me, those that don't agree are too embarrassed to say so. But even color that we think we know, even the color we think we know, isn't as solid as we think it is. Our brains can bamboozle us. Next, please. This made waves on Twitter. Okay, uh, lots and lots of colored balls. I'm not gonna ask you to count them or anything, but most people can see at least three types of colors in these balls, right? Okay, let me show you. I just went to Adobe Photoshop and I cropped the balls and placed them on the side, one click. Okay, we still see three colors. They are just excerpts of the three balls on the left. If you just blow them to high mag, one more click the colors begin to look not quite as different. And now, let's block out the bars, one click. Turns out that all of these balls were actually identical in color. 
okay? Our eyes computed the color for us because of the lines going through them. This is not magic, it's not wizardry, okay? I'm just bringing out that our circuits control our perceptions, okay? It's not wrong for our circuits to control our perceptions. What else is going to control our perceptions, right? But the way the circuits are wired up not only allow us to see and feel and hear, but they also place constraints on what we can see and feel and hear. And most of the time, we are blissfully unaware of those constraints. We don't even imagine how the world is that we don't, that we are unable to perceive. And we are so sure we know what it is. And I'm trying to tell you that there is no is. The world is as we perceive it. And that's a completely different uh, frame of reference, which most of us don't uh, think about. Right? So in, as part of our fascination for our brains, we have to acknowledge that what they're doing is the best they can, our brains and circuits, the best they can with the myriad signals they receive and trying to make sense of the world for us. But because the circuits are also limited, sometimes they just do the best they can and present us colors that aren't even there. Okay? So essentially, context is everything. This was about colors. I'm now going to move to a different modality, sound. I am not going to play the veena. <laughs> but my goodness, what a magnificent demonstration of sound. Okay? What is sound? A physics, physics major will tell you it's vibrations of the air. But my God, those vibrations can make you feel. Did you all not feel? Did you feel the goosebumps? Didn't you feel joy? Didn't you feel emotion? All of that by vibrations? Those vibrations hit our eardrums and then circuitry kicked in. What our circuits did with those perceptions, okay? That's the sound we hear. Outside of our brains, sound is just vibrations. Okay, so aren't we all glad we have our circuits? I'm going to now show you that sound can also play games with us, okay? Next. Let's have the first movie with sound. Would be so nice if we had sound on this one. Can you stop it and play it with sound? Ba, ba. Once more, the first movie. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba. This was not complicated. Baby sounds, ba, 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 ba. If you didn't hear ba, ba, ba. <laughs> Second movie, please. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba. Okay, what did you hear? Ba, 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 right? I heard it too. No, actually, I didn't. No matter how many times I do this experiment, since I had my back to the screen, I actually heard ba, ba, ba. It's gonna knock your socks off when I tell you the soundtrack was playing ba, ba, ba the whole time. But because the lips were going fa, 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 okay, our brains did this, mm, what to do, two, two incoherent signals coming, and let's just tell him he's hearing fa, 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 what's he gonna know? <laughs> I'll prove it to you. Okay, we're going to play the same soundtrack now and both the visuals together. And in the middle of it, close your eyes and open. Look at whichever face you want, close your eyes and open, and you'll see what I heard. Ba, 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 ba. It's not me, it's your brains that did it for you. Okay, they allowed you to hear with your eyes. Okay, now again, this is not just a game. It's trying to tell you that your complex circuitry is doing the best it can in a very messy world, right? Now, if usually you're looking at the person you see who's talking and you're hearing sound from all around you, but you're going to focus on the person whose lips are moving in sync with what you're hearing and you're going to assign the perception. That's what the circuits do. It's not magic or wizardry. In fact, 
Whatever moves, you think that the sound comes from it. I'm playing a monstrous auditory illusion on you right now. My sound isn't coming from my lips, it's coming from the speakers. But you think it's coming from me because my lips are moving in sync, in sync. <laughs> okay, if I practiced hard enough, I could persuade you. Did it work? All right. So, I guess I have brought you to question your circuits even as much you appreciate and admire them. We study how these circuits get wired up. Next slide, please. Ba, no, no. ba, slide, ba. Slide. Okay. This is a picture of the circuits in the human brain. It looks like a wild, riotous mess. Okay. Although it looks like a wild, riotous mess, it's almost like traffic outside, you know, everything. Although the traffic looks messy to an external observer, each car in that traffic knows what it's doing. Yeah? I mean, okay, maybe some of you don't know what you're doing when you're driving out there, but... <laughs> but there is a system of cues, right? There are long-range signals coming from the GPS, okay? Drive on, whatever, for four kilometers, long-range signals then as you approach your destination, you no longer need the long range signals because you recognize local landmarks. There's the temple, the petrol pump, the restaurant, the whatever. You recognize local landmarks, then maybe you enter your uh, building gate or something where there's a gatekeeper who says, okay, does this car belong in this colony, right? Much like that, our nerve pathways are guided in the brain through a system of long range cues, local, signals and gatekeepers and we were privileged to discover a gene that acts as the gatekeeper of sensory nerves coming in to the cerebral cortex. How cool is that? I'm going to show you that in just a little bit but let me first introduce how we do this. Oh, this is like testing my balance here. Let me give you an idea of how we do this. All of our experiments are done on the mouse because until date, I have not found a volunteer enthusiastic enough to give me their brain. <laughs> Gosh, of source. Uh, so we work on the mouse and we work on the mouse for uh, uh, additional reason, okay? So in green over there, the thin line you see are green nerves entering the cerebral cortex of the mouse. That's an entire bundle of sensory nerves entering the cerebral cortex. And that's what they must do from where they originate, the green clump down below. Okay, how do we find out what genes or mechanisms are going to control this very complex trajectory? For this, we use a technology that knocks out genes of interest. We can make a mouse in which a particular gene has been knocked out. Now, what's that? Um, let's see. Suppose an alarm clock landed into your lap from the sky. I bet your generation has not seen a real alarm clock, right? So good, this will work. Imagine if an alarm clock just landed. And it had an hour hand that moved, and a minute hand that moved, and a second hand that moved. And you opened it up, and you saw a whole bunch of gears and all inside. And you said, hmm, I'm going to knock out this one gear. I'm going to knock it out and I'm going to see how it affects the functioning of the alarm clock. And you realize that the hour hand moves and the minute hand moves, but the second hand is stuck. Which allows you to conclude that that gear might have something to do with the functioning of the second hand. Okay? It's a bit of a crude technology because it could have also affected the minute hand which could have secondarily affected the second hand. That's why science is a long process. But this allows you to say, okay, this gear has something to do with the functioning of the second hand and then you can go further. So similarly, we knocked out a particular gene that we thought might be important in this pathway. We knocked it out in the mouse. Next slide. Little mouse. Next uh, click, please. This is the normal mouse brain. These are sections. And those green blobs you can see are actually where the sensory nerves came into the cortex and formed connections. The picture on that side is a high mag. You can see the beautiful innovation, the fibers. Each fiber knows what it's doing and it's wired up correctly. Now what happens when we knock out this single gatekeeper gene? Next click. 
in the knockout mouse brain, we don't see nice little blobs in the cortex. And look, this giant fiber tract has come in and is barely able to penetrate. Okay, it looks like we have found a mechanism that controls the gate of the entry of sensory nerves into the cortex. This mouse has normal eyes, normal ears, normal skin, but it can neither see nor hear nor feel because the nerves carrying all of this information have not entered the cerebral cortex, which is the first station where they deliver the information into the cortex. Okay, so this is where our study is at. It's unpublished. Science is not a done packaged thing to sell. You know, you stock it up on shelves, it's all done. Science is an ongoing process. So I wanted to tell you this process of discovery. Okay, getting us this far took the PhD thesis of two students. And now we're going to probe further and ask, hey, how does it do it? Okay, how does it do it? Now, I've presented to you sensory circuitry, okay? And broadly, basic circuits are similar in all of us. Next slide, please. Okay, our basic circuits are the same, but there are individual differences, no? We're not all clones of each other. In fact, there are individual differences in how we appreciate even the same piece of music, right? Different people hear things differently. And then, in addition to individual differences, circuits can be shaped, click please, they can be shaped by the environment, which is the training and experience you give them, okay? So your differences may either be because of your genes or because of what you expose yourself to and how hard you work at it. Think of a piece of music, the first time you hear a piece of music, okay, you hear it in a certain way. If you hear it over and over again, the 20th time you hear that piece of music, it could be a pop song, it could be classical music, anything. You're hearing it differently because you're attending to different parts of it. Some parts of it you already know, but now you're appreciating the detail between some spaces and so on. Okay, so each time you actually hear, you're doing it differently. You're taking in the information, you're focusing attention, you're processing it differently. And all of this is based on a framework that is different because of your innate abilities. And then if you train very hard at something, you get better and better at it, okay? So I'm going to bring this out. First, I'm going to persuade you that there are genuine innate differences, okay? And I'm going to do this as a neuroscientist with an experiment. I'm gonna have you hear a soundtrack, okay? And I'm do this with some trepidation because this always causes something of a ruckus. Maybe some of you have heard this soundtrack, which some people hear as Yanny and some people hear as Laurel. It's American accent Yanny and Laurel. Let's see what you hear, okay? Next slide, please. Play the movie with sound. Yanny, 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 Yanny. Okay, I can't dare to look, but how many heard Yanny? Okay, look around you, see all the hands. Keep the hands up, let everybody sort of get a sense. And how many heard Laurel? Okay, the brave few. It's okay, it's okay, there's nothing wrong with you. Okay. <laughs> there are innate differences, right? Each time I hear this, I hear it differently because it depends on the sound system it's coming from. And that's sort of the key to these different percepts. One click, please. Yeah. I just said one. Yeah. Click, 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 yes. Wait, wait. So just changing the sound equalizer settings for that same soundtrack is possibly going to change the percept for some of you. Can you play the movie on this slide? Yeah. 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 Okay, how many's perception switched? It's okay, raise, raise it so people can see, you know? So look, a few people's percept switched. I'm not asking it with direction, but it switched. And the rest of you, the percept stayed the same. Okay, one click. We'll now go to a different sound equalizer setting. And now play the movie. Laurel, 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 Laurel. 
Okay, how many perceptions switched? How many perceptions stayed the same for one, two, and three? Look, just look. Look at how many combinations we have, okay? Now, you guys are a really kind and tolerant audience. I've had people come to blows over this. In the middle of my talk, I've had people going, how can you hear Laurel? Are you deaf or what? <laughs> okay, so I hope I've persuaded you that our innate setup is different. Okay, how we're going to process sound is different. Now, add to this, add to this training and experience. Okay, there are some things that you acquire only with training and experience, and this doesn't only apply to sensation. It applies to complex motor skills. Next slide. Okay, how many people can make a roti straight off the bat for the first time? We all know what wonderful maps of Gujarat we make the first time we make a roti, right? If you haven't tried, do it. Okay, it's a complex skill and yet with time you get, a, get it to perfection. The same thing goes to riding a bike, certainly playing a musical instrument. Okay, we have to thank our parents for suffering through our initial attempts at playing a musical instrument. <laughs> it requires an act of great love and tolerance. But eventually, some of us at least, produce beautiful music. And all of that is those same circuits being exposed to a lot of training. How is it possible if I say that all of our behaviors and our abilities come from circuits, and then I say we get better with training? That means the circuits have to change, no? There's no other way. There is no other way. There's no like magic masala you can sprinkle in your head to suddenly, I wish there were, but the circuits have to change. I'm privileged that I work also on a different part of the brain called the hippocampus. Okay, not the hippopotamus, okay, that's different. Hippocampus, it's the center where learning is, learning and memory starts, okay? It's the learning machine of the brain. And in this hippocampus, new neurons get added throughout life. Next slide, please. Here is a regular cage, regular mice in it, and click. There is an enriched cage where the mice are given toys, you know, wheels to run on, tunnels and blocks and things. It's a more interesting environment. If you look at the neurons in the hippocampus of these mice, click please. Here you have a regular neuron, another click. And the mice in the enriched cage get more neurons, but also more branches, more sprouts, more connections. Okay, so this is telling you that Enriched experiences allow your brain to form more complex circuits, and that's the substrate of new learning. Now, we found an interesting genetic mechanism that controls how many neurons are made in the hippocampus. Next. Brains have stem cells, and these stem cells normally produce two kinds of cells. Next. They'll either produce neurons if our particular gene is on, next, or they'll produce a kind of support cell if our gene is off. All right. What my student Lakshmi and Anandita discovered is that if you make this gene permanently on, next, you can get large numbers of neurons coming out from the stem cells at the expense of glia you actually can put extra neurons into the hippocampus, okay? I'll show you a picture of this, next. This is an experiment done by my postdoc, Archana. This is a normal brain, next. Here's a brain where every green, beautiful fiber, next. Shown at high mag here, look at these lovely trees. Okay, all of these are neurons in which this gene was forcibly turned on and they formed into neurons instead of support cells because of the functions of this gene. Now we're asking, are these neurons actually good for hippocampal function? More neurons doesn't mean everything. Sometimes you need more support, right? If you have too many neurons, maybe they mess up the original neurons that are trying to do their job. We don't know. So look at the excitement of science. It's like yesterday we discovered this gene that has this function. Today we've done the experiment to make a mouse with more neurons in its head. And tomorrow we're going to test what do these extra neurons do. Isn't that cool? Okay, this is the ongoing exciting nature of science that we live in every day. Now, 
these new extra connections, extra neurons, don't just form just because by themselves. We have to make them happen. We have to take ourselves into enriched environments, okay? I mean, right now, hopefully, if you're actually getting something from this talk, tick, 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 new neurons are forming in your head all <laughs> We have to take ourselves into spaces that challenge us, right? So every difficult task, every tough assignment, every impossible skill you're trying to learn, all of that actually challenges your brain to forming new connections and acquiring new abilities. And boy, do these connections form? Are these neurons alive? I'm going to show you a movie of a neuron growing in a culture dish to give you a sense of how alive a neuron is. These neurons are practically dancing their way through, through the brain, okay? In fact, sometimes it seems to me that they perform Bharatnatyam and Kathak. I kid you not, I'll show you. Can you, next slide with the movie. So this is the neuron in a dish and it's going to put out many little fibers. Okay, can you play the movie? Look, Bharatnatyam. Yeah, and then one of those fibers says, I'm going to form the output wire, the axon. That's my target. That's how I'm gonna grow, now it's Kathak. Okay, I'm gonna grow there, there, there. <laughs> I mean, look at it. If this neuron was a neuron in the spine of a giraffe, look at what a long way it would have to go to connect to the muscle, right? And look at it doing its job, reaching its target. What are the cues? What are the signals that make all of these grow? These are the kinds of things we study in my developmental neuroscience lab with my students and postdocs. These are the kinds of explorations we do to study, next slide, this amazing structure, the brain, that gives us all of our abilities. Next slide, please. No? Please? <laughs> please? Oh, all right, it was actually just my last slide of the fantastic complex brain. Let's just, let me just wrap up. I hope I've persuaded you that our abilities are all because of our circuits. Our circuits control our perceptions. They control what we can do. They control our limitations as well. But then I've shown you that by taking ourselves to new experiences, new challenges, we can actually grow and modify our circuits. We can acquire skills that we didn't have before. And hey then, why not acquire new thoughts that we didn't have before? Imagine if we have conversations and hear points of views that are completely different from ours, could we not perhaps grow circuits that allow us to be more open, more accepting, more tolerant? Could we not actually grow our circuits to making us better human beings and a better society? It's actually within our abilities to do so, okay? And within this lofty goal, let me now issue a challenge to this audience and to our organizers. We opened with an environmental theme, right? Let's walk the talk. Every little plastic bottle on the table, it's on us. Every plastic bottle we put in the trash is going to outlive us by many, many, many lifetimes. Insist on a glass that can be refilled. Don't add plastic bottles, at least today. Let's walk the talk. A new challenge, a new experience today. Grow some circuits, save the environment. Thank you very much.